probably know, much of the uh, history of uh, African Americans has been uh, hidden or it's been omitted from the historical record. Don Barksdale was an outstanding all-around individual who rose and became quite prominent in the post-war era. Don was, you know, he was a forerunner in so many different things. He was like the first black All-American. 1947 at UCLA, you know, in the days where they, the AEU championships were the big, were a big thing. And Don with the Oakland Bittners, the Oakland Blue and Gold, they were called also. I mean, he went and played and won national championships. And also he was like the first black Olympic basketball player. He was a pioneer. He opened the door for a lot of other guys to make a lot, a lot of money. A lot of the trails he blazed in sports uh, in this area and in college and in professional athletics are pretty much legendary. Uh, Donald Barksdale is one of the great athletes um, you know, the United States has ever, ever produced. I mean, uh, he, he's not as famous as Jackie Robinson, um, but just like Robinson, I mean, he was a multi-sport star. Paying respect to those players that preceded you, uh, not only in professional sports, but in college and in high school, it's very important to understand the history and, and where it has come from to be in the position it's in today. Everybody in the world knows who Michael Jordan is, and a good portion of the world knows Allen Iverson. I just think as a person, sometimes, if you're in a profession, you like to know what, what started this, what made it so sweet for us. It's sad when you go and speak to some of these youngsters today and you ask them do they know any people, and not only uh, African Americans, but some of the Caucasian players. Did you know who George Mikan was? No. Did you know who Earl Lloyd was? No. Did you know who Sweetwater Clifton was? No. Do you know who Don Barksdale was? No. Uh, do you know who Shaquille O'Neal is? Yes. Did you know who the first black NBA All-Star was? First NBA black, um, black All-Star. No, I didn't. I didn't know that. I, and I still don't know that. First black? First black to make the NBA All-Star. Would it have to be, uh... That's a good question. I don't know my history too well. Were you aware that that person was Don Barksdale? I didn't know it was Don Barksdale. No, I didn't. I mean, Can uh, you tell us a little bit about what you know of Don Barksdale? Not too much, you know, I, I mean, I heard of his name and I, and I heard he was a great person. I think their indifference to the pioneers on the race question uh, doesn't have anything to do really with race, it has to do with their, uh, with their disdain for history in any form. I think it has to do with the fact that uh, in the social revolution of the 60s, history became nothing. The past doesn't count. Now it's different. Well, I think the past counts very much. I think we have to just allow them to understand that there were some outstanding people in this league before they got here. And for the young people to understand that this is part of their heritage. Some of the older guys did a lot of work, took a lot of risks, paved the way so that other folks could do some things now. And I think we've lost that. I think that, that in many ways that's sad because there's a lot of younger guys who are taking a lot for granted. And they all, the, the older guys who paved the way for them. One of the, the lines in my favorite song says, a people without a knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. And if you don't know where you came from, how are you going to get to where you're going? And I think the kids in today's society need to know how they got to where they are and how they can help go forward. First of all, I think sports is important to our society. Sports has been a lot ahead of the curve a lot of times, particularly in terms of, of, of racial integration. The role that sports has played in breaking down racial barriers is, is really crucial. Um, and so it's important for people to know the stories of Don Barksdale. It's just like to know the stories of Jackie Robinson. And I also think for um, for youth, and particularly for, for minority youth, it's good to hear a story of someone like Donald Barksdale because the way things are now is not the way it's always been. Berkeley in the 30s, from a racial standpoint, was very segregated. The civil rights laws hadn't even been passed yet, so segregation and discrimination was part of our American way. 
you know, Berkeley was just very racist, it was. My parents, they met in Mississippi, and I guess somehow they uh, decided to go to California, and so they continued on and they purchased a home in Berkeley. Our father worked for the um, Pullman Company and did a lot of traveling for a number of years until he retired. Um, his home base was here in Oakland, California. And my mother was a housewife, but she was also very supportive and uh, worked in activities in the community. I remember Don as early as I, as I can recall. Then we were just kids in the neighborhood. Uh, little Don was there, and I mean little Don. He was a little guy in those days. Oh, we met when we were about four years old. Well, I guess we came to recognize each other or something. When we were younger, they used to think we were twins because we were always together. But the most vivid thing I remember about our early childhood is when his brother died. His brother fell off of his grandmother's front porch and broke his neck. And most of the families in the neighborhood went to the funeral, but Don and I didn't go because we were too young. There was one time when um, Don wanted to, um, I guess, practice or go play ball and he wanted to go over to San Pablo Park and my mom could see the advantages of him enjoying the sports, whereas my dad, whoever made any money bouncing a ball and he, just, he went on and on with it. And uh, later on, my mother informed him, well, stick around and you'll find out. And the first time I interviewed Don, well, it may have been 15 years ago, and one of the things he talked about was that his um, father worked on the railroad. And I think he was part of the Pullman Porters um, Union. And um, so when Don was a kid, he used to go to some of the meetings, the Pullman meetings, with his father. And I think, I think he heard A. Philip Randolph, who at that time was the head of the, uh, of the Pullman Porters. And um, Randolph would talk about, you know, having to, to be tenacious, you know, to, to, to try your best, you know, overcome obstacles. And I think hearing those things when Don was very young had a great impact on him. I used to go up to the University of California and watch the football games and I saw some guys that I thought were good ball players, great ball players. Uh, but my first hero was really Jackie Robinson and um, that was the first one that I saw that I really thought it was uh, sort of an idol to me. I was about 14 years old when I first saw Jackie and I'd have to say he was my first big hero. As we got older, Don and I were going to Berkeley High School. We took college prep courses. We weren't brilliant students, but we were good students. So they had uh, tryouts for the basketball team, which Don and I were both eligible for. And Don and I tried out, and we didn't make the team. And that's when I first became aware of racism. That was our 10th grade year. And Donald used to joke about the fact that three years in a row, he was the first guy on the cut list um, at Berkeley High because his name started with B, so he was at the top of the list. So he didn't play high school ball, which you know would seemingly um, would make it impossible for him to play college ball. Live Oak Park, there was a summer league up there, and these guys were all college players. And that's when it really got rough. The guys there up at uh, Live Oak, they were stronger and taller than we were and more mature, but we had to bounce. So he learned on the playground. And the coach at College of Marin, I think his name was Scoop Carlson, um, saw Donald play and thought, well, gee, this is a guy I'd like to have on my team. So um, Carlson recruited Donald and um, M. Chapman, too, also to play at College of Marin. And from our freshman year at Marin till through our sophomore years, we went down to Modesto and we won the Modesto Tournament, which is like the state title for junior colleges. One of the 
sports writers referred to Don and I as the Gold Dust Twins. It's a very demeaning picture to me. It's a picture of two little black kids on, the, on a soapbox and stuff and their big lips and big eyes. And I found it demeaning. So I told Don I was going to write the paper protesting about being depicted as the Gold Dust Twins. And Don told me, says, any publicity is good publicity. So that's one of our first real confrontations. Don was a very ambitious young guy. He was a hell of an athlete. He could, he could run track. And then he'd gotten a scholarship down to UCLA. The war broke out. Rather than go into service, I chose to go to the shipyard where they were hiring people to work in Richmond. And rather than going back to Marin for my final about three or four months, I thought if I were in the shipyard doing the national defense, they wouldn't draft me as, as readily or quickly as they did, you know, other guys that weren't. But that didn't turn out to be the case. I went to the shipyard, Don stayed at Marin, and I got drafted before Don did. <laughs> Way back in the early 40s, uh, Abe Saperstein uh, had been contacting me since the first year I was at UCLA. And I went to the Army, and I was at Camp Lee, Virginia. And uh, while I was at Camp Lee, Virginia, uh, the Globetrotters were playing in Chicago. And he asked me, come on, why don't you play with us, and so on and so on. I almost, in fact, I got dressed to go down and play and changed my mind at the last minute and said, no, uh, Abe, uh, I said, I'm going to pass. And uh, I'm glad I did because... I went back to UCLA and the Olympic Games came later. The whole works came a little bit later. And had I played with the Globetrotters in that one time, that would have been it. And I had to go to UCLA. I managed to get out and see Don play at UCLA. It, it was not at all a setting like today, that is, it was like a high school gymnasium, you know, and uh, I guess this was the stair step you took to move up. Phyllis and I lived at uh, 1040 West Washington Boulevard in Los Angeles, and uh, many of my buddies stayed there. Don, Emerson, Sonny Love would live there for an extended period of time when I was traveling around with my band. The four of us, Don, Bob Reed, and Sammy Miller were living together and we were all from Berkeley. So we used to ride together out to school. I met Don around 1946. It was just after World War II. We both had been to the service and uh, before Don was playing for UCLA, USC used to beat UCLA, but when Don and Dave Miner were playing for UCLA, they beat SC. And at that time, Don was the big star in Los Angeles. When Don was going to UCLA, uh, they used to always kid Dave Miner because Dave would call time out to see how many points he had scored up until that point of the game. Davidge and Don hit it off very good at UCLA. They were close friends and they were roommates naturally on the team. Don was very private kind of guy, even though we all lived together, but. He would kind of isolate himself every once in a while, and he was uh, practicing being a radio announcer or something. I think he had some kind of feelers for a program up north, but he was practicing privately on how to do this. 
Don, at this time, I'm sure needed money, and he decided to open up a record shop. And his record shop was right next door to our chicken market. Don, I think, took out his GI Bill or took a loan out somehow or other, and he, uh, he opened up a record shop on Western Boulevard. It was very unique at that time because there were not that many black businesses on Western Avenue at that time. And uh, there were only two black record stores in Los Angeles. And he had Sammy and I doing little things to help him out in the record shop. When Don was in school or away, Bob Reed was the prime mover of the record shop. And well, he had a nice clientele. King Cole used to come in there. And uh, Don would have a promotion trying to sell Sarah Vaughn's records or King Cole's records. They would come to his record shop. And if you bought their records, they would uh, autograph the records as you bought them. And he had built up quite a business at his record store. It really was frustrating because you'd see ball players that were playing pro ball and you knew that you could play just as well or better than some of them, but you didn't get a chance. And that was the tough part. You loved to play the game, but there just wasn't any opportunity for you. I got into the newspaper business, came back from the Army to finish college. In 1948, uh, I got a regular job with the Herald Tribune. When I went over there, from then on for the next nine years, uh, I was with the next from start to finish every season. When the NBA started, life was very segregated in every way, all day long, everywhere. And there was very little, even in the big cities, mixing of black and white. That, that's what segregation was about. For the white world, the black world didn't exist. The NBA made a big deal out of using college rules and trying to play a college-style game. What they were after was the players coming out of college, and they were all white. A promoter would say, whether he meant it or not, that, uh, well, I don't know, maybe my white customers don't like sitting next to black customers, and that, that would become a problem in ticket selling and so forth. Essentially, there were some very clear rules in America that, that ended up being a clear problem for black folk. We were told and taught for survival pur purposes to stuff the feelings. It wasn't healthy to express how you feel. There were certain things that you could or could not do and the rules were very clear. I've learned over the years what things were like, but I wasn't conscious of it, that that was the whole problem. Now, you, you gotta remember, I'm coming from a white world where I'm not aware of any of this. And I guess Don endured whatever <clears throat> the difficulties were at that time for black players to uh, play uh, in the NBA. Don Barksdale had to have put up with a lot simply to survive, and he would have to be enraged and it, would, it, it had to be one of the things that would motivate him to uh, make some change, to be involved, to, to develop your a sense of autonomy from that really overtly racist system. When you played for the AAU, you used about two or three years, and if you went to the NBA, you'd become older like Barksdale. Well, my first recollection of Don Barksdale was uh, he was a great basketball player. And uh, I can recall going and seeing him play in the Oakland Auditorium in the AAU basketball. He played AAU for a long time. He probably should have went to the NBA before he went because he was a great player. The formation of the business was uh, uh, done by Lou Bittner, who was an income tax uh, agent in Oakland on 13th Street. And he brought players from different big schools into the NIBL, the National Industrial Basketball League. And a lot of the players worked for the concerns. They received money to play, and they also received a job. 
regardless whether they said we were amateur or not, everybody was getting paid. AAU, where I played in, the, in Los Angeles, uh, the 20th Century Fox subsidized us, and I played for them, along with Alex Hannum and Bill Sharman. The Oakland Fitness came to Reno and played the University of Nevada, of which I was a starting center. And uh, my job, naturally, was to defend Barksdale. That's impossible. After the game, Don came over to the locker room as a gentleman that he always was and asked me when I get out of college if I joined the Bittners. And uh, it was a great experience for me. In fact, this is my whole life. The Industrial League was just as professional as the others, except that the, they were employees of the company that was sponsored. So they could say legitimately, well, we're paying him to work with Phillips Oil, and his job is to play in our basketball game. And we traveled all over the United States, and uh, naturally we traveled always by airplane. That AEU basketball was at least comparable to the NBA, and Don was one of the best. And he was way ahead of his time. Uh, he had great moves under the basket, outside, he got way up above the rim. And he had quick hops at that time. You know, most guys were taller than he, but he, he got up quick. Barksdale had so much spring in his leg, he reminds me of Jordan. And in those days, nobody slammed the ball or anything. They didn't, nobody had thought about it. But he certainly could do anything you see today's players do. In the beginning, we were the first team to use a full court press, which disturbed a lot of teams. So if he, on a fast break, as he he came opposite the foul line, he would cut on a diagonal for the basket, and Marshy would just throw the ball high. And from that, he'd stuff it. Nobody could stay with Don, and the rest of the players just didn't, didn't jump that high. Boss could take off, and he never came down. He was a guy who could very well be in the NBA today. AAU ball was the next thing to the pros. They had the tournament and the championship in Denver. In uh, 1948, uh, we, the Bittners, uh, qualified for the Olympic tryouts, of which they selected Don for uh, the Olympics. They had a uh, tournament at Madison Square Garden, and Don was most outstanding. Donald was eventually picked for the Olympic team as one of the at-large players. Even before he got to the point of, of working out with the team, um, the, the original tension was just whether he was going to be named to the team. Um, because again, as a, as a black player, he would have been the first ever. And there was a lot of resistance to putting him on the team. Um, and there was a local Oakland politician named Fred Maggiora who really lobbied the, the coaches. Um, Adolph Rupp, who was the head coach of the team, was well known for basically being a racist and certainly at that time had vowed that he'd never have a black player at, at Kentucky. Um, so um, and Jory told him Don Barksdale is the best player in the country outside of Curlin. How in the world can you keep him off the Olympic team? So um, it was a lot of lobbying and, and uh, I think Don said that Jory caught holy hell for doing it but he stuck in there and eventually got Don on the team. So without Jory, this history wouldn't have happened. Um, and then what they did is they split the team into two parts. And I think the interesting part is that the AAU team was, the, was run by an assistant coach, his name was Bud Browning. And Browning took his team, which was the Phillips 66 team, um, to where they are headquartered, which is in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And uh, Bartlesville was a severely segregated uh, city, and Oklahoma was a severely segregated state. And in fact, um, Donald playing for the Oakland Bittners had been the first black player to play in a mixed race sports event in the state of Oklahoma. So his presence in Bartersville was going to be a touchy situation. Because Adolph Rupp was such a staunch racist, and of course Kentucky was very segregated at the time, he, he, when, when it came time to start traveling to Lexington to play this exhibition game, Adolph Rupp, he, he let other people know on the Olympic team that he did not want Donald to play in that, in, in that game because he would feel that would like be an insult if he let a black player play on his home turf. And um, it turned out that a player named Jackie Robinson, who is a, a white player, ironically named Jackie Robinson, who, who was from Baylor University, um, 
he was in this conversation, and eventually he said, well, you know what we'll do? We'll just tell Rupp, you know, if Donald can't play, we refuse to play. But to do it, there had to be this compromise, and the compromise was that Donald, as usual, could not stay with the team. In addition to the normal, type, normal for black people struggles that Donald had to go through, um, one of the one that was an exceptional struggle was that when he did play in that exhibition game in Kentucky against the uh, the University of Kentucky half of the Olympic team, um, he played uh, knowing that his life had been threatened the night before, and so Donald. I think he said he only mentioned it to people at the house he was staying at, but he didn't tell anybody else. Let me put it this way. When I first joined the team, I would say that uh, Adolf Rupp was a racist. Uh, but when we finished the Olympic Games, I would say that he had overcome a big part of his racism and that he had made up in his mind that uh, it wasn't quite like he had thought it was and that he was going to look for a, a black player. Uh, he didn't do it right away, but he did. He was the first one to break the color line in the SEC. Don was an entrepreneur at heart. He became friends with quite a few influential people. They all, in some way, help enhance his uh, earning ability. You know, my relationship with Donald was based on his basketball um, history. But in fact, he was, he was probably more of an entrepreneur than he was an athlete. Don had his hands in many different functions. Luckily, he, he, he could handle them all. He was a radio announcer. He was a distributor for beer. He was doing everything. And he wasn't making bad money and still was, still was an amateur and a supreme athlete. Big Don was a, was a really cool DJ. And uh, my understanding is he started out in jazz at KROW. And jazz was always his first love. He was really bigger than life. People love Big Don Barksdale. Don was a good disc jockey. People were crazy about him. The people knew who he was because of his, of how he excelled in the sports world. So when he moved to, to radio, it was a natural. He was sort of a soul brother because he was the eminent disc jockey in Northern California for years. That smooth voice, that velvet voice of his, he could just talk to you. Don crossed racial lines. Uh, people of other races listened to him as, uh, as much as they did any, uh, anybody else on the air because he played music that everybody could understand and could appeal to and he had a manner about him that people understood. But the environment in which he lived was one of total segregation of the media. And there was very few nights I didn't have the radio want to listen to Don. In fact, I used to enjoy calling him while he was on the radio so he could play a song for me. Johnny Otis, you know, went to Berkeley High School with Don, and they were good buddies. And he had three number one hits in 1950. We would come here a couple of times a year. Here, by here, I mean the Bay Area. And while I was here, Don would have me picked up, and I'd go to the station, and we would do interviews and talk, talk on the radio. You know who he reminds me of the most, and certainly had to be the forerunner of, would be like Magic Johnson. Don also uh, had access to a local uh, beer franchise. There had never been a black beer distributor in the city of Berkeley or Oakland, and Don was the first black uh, beer distributor of this blue and gold beer. And he had several trucks on the streets and have about 10 or 11 drivers. The things that he went into at that time, no blacks had ever done before. When black people try to branch off today, there is no way, it seems to me, that they can do it with as great a versatility as, say, Don was able at that time. And it could be because Don was one of the first to do it. He had his hands in everything. He had his own variety show on TV. He showed all these old videos, these old jazz videos back in the 40s and the 50s of Basie and Ellington 
And I mean, just all these great old videos that you don't see anymore. You know, it was like getting an education of black history and black musicians, what jazz people were about. People would be lining up to get on his program as an advertiser because Don had an audience that they could sell their products to. Don, by that time, had established himself as a tremendous broadcasting figure. Well, he was very smooth and uh, knew the breadth of the topics about uh, jazz, about music, about black people, otherwise known as sapia people. And when you look to a pioneer, there is no one who can come up with a greater uh, list of productivity uh, than um, a Don. And that's what I think has spawned so many black people in getting involved in the variety of entrepreneur uh, enterprises as they do. People look at the NBA now and 80% of the players in the NBA are black. And people don't even know about the fact that you know, there weren't any black players until 1950 in the NBA, and that it started with a trickle. In that first year, 50, uh, Chuck Cooper coming out of Duquesne was the first one drafted. Now that's, I guess, when sometime in April or May. Uh, Sweetwater Clifton was the first one to sign an NBA contract because the Knicks bought it from the Globetrotters, whom we'd been playing with. And Earl Lloyd then was the first one to actually play a game because that's the way the schedule broke. Barksdale came along the following year uh, because he'd spent that first year still playing out on the coast here. And say in 50, 51, 52, 53, the segregation mentality is still very strong. Now in those days, those first four players were looked upon primarily as rebounders. And that became very much a pattern for the first set of black players. The stereotypes in people's minds are very strong. And uh, you're a big, strong guy. You concentrate on getting the ball. You, just, you rebound, defend, and that's your job. I think Clifton suffered the most from that because he could have been a much, much better offensive player. But that isn't how they used him, and that isn't the role they had in mind for him. Uh, Sweetwater Clifton, now, he came from the Globetrotters, so he was much more experienced in, in, in this kind of ball, and he played, uh, uh, he was like a, a center. Earl had a good outside shot. He drove to the basket, big, strong guy. And Chuck Cooper was similar to, to Lloyd. He was a good shooter, well-built, and uh, they were all good players. What I find really interesting uh, in terms of the, the old guys, they had huge baggage to carry. Black players could not live where white players stayed. They uh, had, had separate uh, quarters in terms of getting themselves ready for games. Earl Lloyd came to, came to Washington, was a really good player. And when we traveled in some of the cities, that it was a different situation. We could not have Earl stay at the same hotel that we were in. And Rose McKinney, who was a Southern uh, uh, man from North Carolina, and I offered to room with him at a hotel that we, he could get into. I mean, this sounds terrible because me being from the West Coast, I went back there and I, I didn't know any of this stuff. Baltimore had won a championship in the second year of the league when they came in the league. They were the league champions in 48 season. Baltimore was uh, a place where uh, they operated in a shoestring. I think it was 1950. And they wanted me to be a player coach. So they phoned me and asked me if I would be interested, and so they, they made a deal, and I became a player coach. In the meantime, they had signed Don Barksdale and Dave Miner from the San Francisco Bentners. When he came into the NBA, he came in as one of the 10 highest paid players in the league. And he came in not only being a player, but also having a post-game radio show. 
He, I mean, who knows? He may have been the first in the league anywhere to, to be a player to have that while he was playing. He was a smooth guy. He could run like a deer. So it made it look good for me to be coaching a player of that caliber. And he could really run, and he was very good around the basket. And Don put out all the time and uh, did a good job for me. Despite the fact that uh, he hadn't had experience in this type of a game, he did well. And what I have to say about Don, and this is why I think that uh, he would have been one of the greatest players in the NBA, that when he came the first year, he didn't have an outside shot. But it took him the one year to really develop the 15, 18 foot shot. And so that made him much more effective and, and difficult to guard. Later, he played with Boston and they started to started to catch on. Box rolled into Boston in a big white to caddy convertible somewhere around 1953 when we traded for him. And I, I'd never met anyone who, as they say, who enjoyed life quite as much as, as he did. And athletically, none of us had really seen uh, a player who, who, who could do the things, uh, you know, athletically that he did on a basketball floor. He made the all-star team. He was a hell of a rebounder. He had a rebound and he could do. And he was fast. He could run for his side. He was tenacious. Bob Cousy made me feel completely at home and opened the door so wide open that he brought me in like a brother. And uh, Red Arbach made one thing very clear, and this is what he said. You give me 100%, and you don't have to worry about anything. You'll play. I mean, it's like, I guess, evolution in terms of Don was the first one athletically that, that was able to do some of the things that, that Jay and Michael and, you know, all the other great athletes now have, have brought to the next level. You know, point guards love to get guys that, uh, that move without the ball and move quickly without the ball and, of course, who shoot pretty well, and uh, Box had that in abundance. I have vague recollections of seeing him on television, and I think I saw him play for the Celtics when television was just starting in the 50s and they started to do NBA games. I grew up in New Jersey, and obviously there weren't a lot of African Americans playing basketball at that time. I think Sweetwater Clifton. Uh, Don Barksdale, uh, Earl Lloyd, and Chuck Cooper were the only ones playing at that time. And so when you had an opportunity to see an African-American play, uh, it, it really just made you uh, well up with pride. Boston rivaled Montgomery, and folks at Boston may not know that he had no one to deal with, but Boston was rough in terms of racial relations. I mean, uh, bigotry's been around since Adam and Eve. I mean, uh, if it's not black-white, it's got to be something else. You know, we brought in a lot of guys from like the Deep South, you know, who, who might have had pretty strong biases coming in. There was much less direct opposition to the black players in basketball They're by their teammates and opponents uh, than Jackie Robinson had to go through in baseball. In 13 years, whether it, from going from, from Coop to Box to and then Russ and Casey, Sam, the whole thing, I mean, I never remember any racial overtones within the unit. Al Beck, in that sense, I think deserves a lot of credit in terms of how he handled the black athlete coming into the unit, and I thought he kind of rose above petty bigotry. We didn't win the championships, but we came in second behind the Lakers, and the Lakers had Mike and Mickelson and Pollard and uh, they were tremendous basketball players. Box was the perfect spokesperson, just as Jackie was for baseball as well, in that 
In terms of his uh, participation as the first black athlete in an All-Star game, I, you know, they couldn't have chosen a better guy at the time. Don was one of the most gifted athletes that I had ever seen. When I, I found him to be uh, a fine man, and uh, uh, I was proud to play with him. He finished the year before Russell came, before they became great. Actually, it's a history that goes back to the 1950s. And when I was in high school, and rock and roll and rhythm and blues were just starting to come together, there was a radio station called KWBR. Don Barksdale was one of their disc jockeys. So I'm listening to Fats Domino and Little Richard, you know, Big Joe Turner, you know, people I hadn't heard before, but I was just coming into my teenage years, just like kids today hearing rap for the first time. They called it race music because white people didn't know how to handle it. In 57, the two main jocks were uh, Big Don Barksdale and Bouncing Bill Doubleday. Then in uh, 58, uh, the Warner Brothers sold KWBR to uh, uh, Sonderling Broadcasting out of Chicago, which already owned WDIA in Memphis. And so the call letters became KDIA. and. Uh, Big Don Barksdale stayed there uh, for several years, and uh, and so did Bounce and Bill, and was joined by Jumpin' George and uh, R.P. from Tennessee, and uh, Jeannie B. and Wally Ray. And he had another guy with him, and everybody thought this guy was black, and he turned out to be white. Jumpin' George, Oxford was his last name. Uh, white guy from Florida, who talked with a really weird. Uh, but intriguing mix of a British and Southern accent. And when you met George Oxford, you thought you were meeting uh, Walt Disney or somebody. Really, he looked like Walt Disney, but he was bad. George Oxford, Big Daddy Don Barksdale. Uh, he's the one that started Rhythm and Blues on KWBR in 47. The music scene in Oakland was just really alive. I mean, something was happening every night, and there were all these great local artists who were playing around, who were making records for local labels and, 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 and getting airplay. On a radio station in Long Beach called KFOX, Johnny Otis had a radio program. And he was playing this record called Ruby Ruby by Little Willie Littlefield. You know, it wasn't till later that I found out that that was on Don Barksdale's Rhythm Records label from, from here in Oakland. Rhythm records were not heard or distributed much beyond the Bay Area. You know, rhythm really only existed from about 56 to 58, but produced a whole lot of great music, especially this vocal group from Pittsburgh, California, called Alice Jean and the Mondellos. Rhythm 45s are ultra rare, and they are worth a lot of money if, if they're in good condition. Big Don told me he got into R&B because that, that, that's where the money was. And as a disc jockey, I mean, he had a natural outlet to play his own records. And the fact that he would support Bay Area musicians, he would try always to get their, their records on the air, especially if he saw someone that was really talented. I mean, he would really get behind that person and try to help him. Slim Jenkins Club was down on 7th Street, and he always had first-class room. This was during the time when Willie Mays first came to San Francisco. They couldn't go into white clubs in San Francisco, so they had to come this side of the bay. Then Don came on the scene, and his club became the spot. Jay Payton was like the sort of the central figure in all this scene as the MC of so many of the shows that, that went on at the Sportsman the Showcase. I worked for Don for, oh gosh, many, many, many years and uh, handled a lot of shows. Everybody was anybody that played the showcase in the sports because that was the Chilling Circuit spot. In the early days, man, the Chilling Circuit was the black clubs and the black theaters. Don was one of those guys that he saw the future of Oakland in the entertainment industry. He really catered to the Bay Area people. And that was important to him, to make sure that they got the best entertainment, 
that he could possibly give them. Don would tell me a, a little bit later about all the, the acts that would come through play here, like Red Fox came through, Flip Wilson, people like that. And uh, he would have two different things going on at, at the two different spots. I remember sometimes my brother Coke and I, we would be there playing and sometimes he'd walk in the front door and all those people were looking at us playing. As soon as Don walked in, everybody's attention went to Don, you know, they were just following him across the room, you know. Cool was the way that you carried yourself and the way that you dressed. You don't see many embodiments of cool. Dean Martin was cool. Don Barksdale was cool. And just, the, you know, the Mr. B look with the Billy Eckstein collar. And Don was that kind of cool. I lived on Stewart Street in Berkeley. And the sportsman's club, I don't think he had had it very long when I met him. Then he had the radio work he was doing. Being 14 years younger than Big Don, I really didn't know about his basketball background at all. You know, I'd go somewhere and somebody would say, was Big Don ever a all-star? I said, I really don't know, because he was very, um, humble about his career, and he didn't talk about it that much. You know, growing up in Oakland, California, there were not a lot of African-American heroes who were in the spotlight. Don Barksdale was one, you know, he was on KDIA radio. So he was really popular, because he was on an early evening, and he always uh, stayed friends with, with sports celebrities, so he could throw in little personal notes about people. He would bring things to you that he had experienced, not only in business, but on the radio and in and athletics. And I think if, if you were smart, you always listened to his program, because you always had a chance to learn something. And he was just kind of a guy that always exuded tack class and he had a lot of talent himself. Don was a name, a real solid name in the, in the entertainment business. Went right from basketball to radio to nightclub and he knew a lot of people. I got a picture with Don and uh, Muhammad Ali. I remember the time the Whistles came to Oakland in 64 and uh, at that time uh, the battles were the hottest attraction around here. I've worked a lot of shows with Anna James. i worked a lot of shows with Ike and Tina. They used to play there two, three, four times a year. I remember uh, Lou Rawls playing at the showcase. I had just put out my first album, Stormy Monday, with Les McCann. Back in those days, everybody used to go and hang out at the radio station, you know, to see who was going to come by the station, you know, and they knew everybody was going to come by to see Don. So we went over and we went to the radio station and I met Don, just happened that Don was on the air at the time. So we met and he said, I really like your album, man. He says, you ought to come up and perform in my club. I said, you got a club? He said, yes, why don't y'all come by later? So promotion man took me by there that evening. It was Latin night. It was Pete and Coke Escobedo. And the place would be jam packed, you know. You know, everything was happening. It was really jumping. And that's how we came to meet Lou Rawls, who was, of course, you know, going to play at his club. And we got to meet Lou and hung out together, and, you know, we were just remained friends over the years. So that, you know, a lot of good things that happened uh, uh, in our association with Don. But, uh, you know, he, he, he was just really a pioneer of, for that era. When I would go in his office and I'd see these pictures on the wall, I said, Wow, oh, man, I didn't know you played pro ball, you know, because I did. I mean, it wasn't, it was something Don to have been, uh, I guess you could say, a pioneer as he was. There was really not that much said about him or, or, or exposed about him. Everybody knew him. They knew who he was. Don was always a, a quiet guy. He was always a, a humble fellow. At the clubs, he would have, there was a lot of dancing, drinking, and smoking. And I remember he always had my mother and I praying that it wouldn't rain on the nights when he had the big stars coming in because people didn't like to come out in the rain. The club was very popular, so he drew people from all over the Bay Area. He ran his business the way he ran his life. I think it was what people long for today. They felt it belonged, the, the, his club belonged to you as much as it did to him. 
that it was a place for friends to go and to meet and, um, and where the guys could do a lot of, as my dad used to say, hoorahing with one another. <laughs> Don had a lot of contacts and he did his, his best to try to help a lot of the youngsters coming out of the Oakland Public Schools. And the fact that he was so involved in the sports scene of, of what Oakland was, I mean, helped to really, I thought, to bring the Warriors and, and everything here to Oakland. My dad was uh, probably the all-American dad, I think. Although my parents, you know, were divorced, he didn't break the ties between, you know, his kids like some fathers do. Derek has, I'd say, years that he's, you know, would go with Big Don to uh, basketball games and things like that. My father enjoyed talking about sports, taking his sons, both me and my brother, to basketball games, baseball games, football games. He was a scout for the Warriors for a while, so I think I've seen out of the 88 games that I think they had each year, and about 40 of them were home games, I think I saw about 39 of them most of the time. In the early 80s, uh, in the city of Oakland, there were a number of things that were happening that really uh, created a lot of problems for our city. And at the time when the effects of Proposition 13 finally settled in, it really had a devastating effect on uh, the Oakland Athletic League. Times were a little tough uh, for the OEL because the district would get money, but they would put the money into other programs. And for some reason, people think athletics should, should uh, just run itself. There were budget cuts as a result of Proposition 13. And we were going to wind up having to, to pay participation fees for uniforms and possibly money for travel, uh, particularly on the bus. So consequently, there was going to be no more money. The budget was the same as it was for boy sports like 10, 15 years before. So help had to come from some direction. How do they justify that? I don't understand that. How do they justify cutting out arts and music and athletics in the school? The budgets generally, if there's going to be any cuts, they're first going to be cuts outside of the classroom. And obviously, something like sports is going to be hit very hard. The Oakland Public Schools and the OAL didn't have a lot of money. You know, it, it was kids like us, you know, growing up in the ghetto, in the hood. And, and our parents doesn't, didn't have a lot of money, and we didn't have a lot of things that we can go and give, give our kids. I knew that there were problems uh, in the OAL as far as school, so I knew there was problems as far as sports, uh, but I didn't know to what extreme those problems were. You know, the impact on my, um, that basketball had on my life playing here in Oakland, California was that, you know, it was a tough league. Uh, it got me a lot of toughness, it got me a lot of heart. And coming into the NBA, you need that kind of heart because a lot of guys are going to take, take that heart away from you or try to take that heart from you. And that was one of the main things of the Oakland Public Schools playing out here was, was good for me. Well, I was a principal of an elementary school in Lafayette, Indiana, and um, Don called uh, because he knew he was ill and he was at the Veterans Hospital in Martinez, California and he was very sick and that we were just not sure what might happen. While he was in the hospital he was reading the paper uh, and he noticed that many of the students there mentioned were having difficulty with the financial part of sports, the different expenses that came along with playing high school ball. When I went down to see my father, um, he had some pancreas problems at that point in time. And I remember talking to him as he laid in the bed, and it was just me and him talking about uh, sports, talking about uh, life, talking about how I was doing in school. And uh, just at that point in time, he told me that he's going to go through some different changes in his life. He's going to start doing more for the community. I said, Dad, what are you going to do? While he was in the hospital, flat on his back, he decided to start Save the High School Sports. You know, when the government failed to provide funds for kids in school, I mean, he was a big part of making sure that 
uh, high school sports was going to be saved in the schools. And so Don wanted to make sure that the money he raised did not go for expenses and administration. Don and I had this meeting and he said, you know, um, I've got an idea and that idea is that uh, we can deal with youngsters, deal with the community, deal with the business world and everything else all in one shot. I said, now how will we do that, Don? He says, well, he says, first of all, we would put on a lunching or a dinner, whichever one is most feasible, and have big time people wait on the community. I said, well, no, big time people like what? He says, he says, oh, he says, like Lou Rawls, Henderson, he named off several ballplayers, Willie Mays. I says, how are you going to get his? He says, I know all those people. He says, all I got to do is just let them know that I need help and uh, we, we can get it. I mean, it was basically him going around the stations, going, you know, getting guys. And he did it because he saw something, a problem with high school sports that needed money. And he said, well, what are my resources? What can I do to help this problem? He basically lifted the bar. He lifted the, the criteria. What he was doing for high school kids went above and beyond throwing a dinner, you know what I mean, and going to the school and speaking about drugs. And when I got to know him and finally saw what he was trying to do, I thought to myself that this man maybe is a saint. The things that Donald accomplished um, against the odds he had to face were phenomenal. And I think that's a, a, a great, uh, he, he therefore is a great role model for anybody. And when you have people like Don Barstale who have paid a price, who have given of their time, who've tried to make it better for the kids who are following them, then you have that responsibility kind of put on you. It's, it's up to you to make it better for the kids who are going to come after you. Barksdale went to many new frontiers and we owe him a debt of gratitude as we owe a debt of gratitude to all of the African-American pioneers who forage new ground.